Are we streaming? Probably. <laughs> Can somebody say hello to us? It, it's always fascinating when we don't know if we're alive or not. I don't know. You're supposed to know everything. How? How? I, I. You have the Googles in front of you. Oh, oh, and that's how you know that the thing that you're trying to do is actually working. Come you on. Could, I don't know. Come on. Are know. you? Is this the first time? I'm Pamela. I just learned how computers work. <laughs> oh my God. Can't I do a bad job at making fun of you? All right, people have. Uh, seem to be there in the chat they know that we're here so let's uh let's say hi okay. to people i can say hi to arnold post astro b kathleen bontea chris adams colin jones daniel mccool frank kenny giselle sabarin Guido bibra harry m hugo burnham john suffield kate k quad libet larry beckham linda Sadik, michael meyer nance graziano oil period <laughs> paul gracie rick schwartz Sylvan Westby, Space TV, Tom Van Scotter, and William Van de Beek, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Astronomy Cast. And look at that background behind you, Pamela. You're, you're home. I'm, I'm home. It's true. It's true. Nice I, work. I, yeah, I don't know quite how I pulled it off. Sometimes it seemed like it just was never going to happen again. Give us the update. What happened? <laughs> so, oh, man, um, I think uh, last time we we met, I had just gotten back from the Netherlands and I was. No, is that correct? Where? No, I had just gotten back from Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so so in the past eight weeks, I have gone to Amsterdam for a computer science conference, come home. I have gone to uh, Israel for uh, a, a big data science and morality conference. I don't even know what bin to put that one in. I have come home. I then went to Japan <laughs> for the communicating astronomy yeah. to the public meeting, which I have to say was the the best meeting i've ever and been you to. weren't the only one it was like a black hole of co of connections like I, I reached out to a yeah. pile of people and they were all like i'm in japan i'm in japan yes, yes. yeah we so. had we had 500 people between the attendees the volunteers and the yeah. press that attended this meeting it was a who's who of the people who are doing science communications from the passion side of it yeah so I don't know why you weren't there. You should have been there. Well, it sounds like it would have been. A, uh, did you have to pay for it? Yes. Yeah. Well, there you it's go. It's true. Uh, but there there were people from 53 different countries yeah. there. And every talk was worthwhile. I've, I've never gone to a meeting where I didn't like want to rage quit at least one of the talks. Mm -hmm. I, I've never gone to a meeting where there wasn't at least one talk that caused me to be like, this person's methods are horrible in Slack to a colleague. Um, this one, I never, I was like, I want to work with all of you yeah. forever. Yeah. It was fabulous. It was fabulous. Yeah. I, uh, that sounds like a good one. Oh, hopefully they'll do one, you know, nearby, like in, <sighs> on the, you know, in the continent, perhaps on Vancouver Island. That would be helpful. Well, Victoria was a finalist in the past, so we just need to talk to those people about re reapplying with Victoria. Perfect. Uh, all right. So if you're wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, this is going to be a live episode of Astronomy Cast. That's Pamela. I'm Fraser. Uh, we're going to take about half an hour-ish as Pamela takes us down the rabbit hole of new particle discoveries. And then we will stick around and answer your questions about space and astronomy or anything for until the end of the hour. So let's uh, let's get started. Tell me when you're ready. I am pressing record. It's... I am also pressing record. Recordings Hello, are happening. Chad. Buongiorno, Chad. He's in Italy That's... right now. Oh, he moved. Just briefly. Okay. Yeah, he went on a vacation. That's one of the advantages of being in Europe is you get to go to Italy. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 486, particle physics update. 
Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and, oh, it is Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well, Fraser. How are Man, you doing? To my, everything disappeared here in front of me here. There we go. Do we need to start over? No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, you're back from all kinds of trips. I I am. I uh, most recently returned from attending a communicating astronomy with the public meeting over in Japan, where I got to be face to face with Aviva Yamani, who's our uh, project director for 365 days of astronomy. So that was quite exciting. And all the other awesome humans who are in science communications from all the places I don't get to visit were there. Yeah. So yeah, it, there was, it was clearly amazing. This gigantic uh, group that was there because I, my normal people for reaching out for outreach, each person was, Oh, I can't this week. I'm in Japan. Oh, I can't this week. I'm in Japan. Like, okay, I get it now. i I should be in Japan. Just ask. We yeah. can see if we can get All you right. there next All right. time. All right. Next year. Next year. I believe I communicate astronomy to the public. You do. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get on with this week's show. So uh, it's time for a news update, this time from the field of particle physics. Turns out there have been all kinds of new and interesting particles discovered by the Large Hadron Collider and others. Let's get an update from Pamela. So... I, I want to start this episode with the disclaimer that I am sure there is a particle out there that uh, that you missed. I, yeah, yeah, I, I'm quite certain of that. So this this is going to be my best attempt, and I'm sure there's going to be gaps. So apologies if I miss your favorite new discovery. Uh, I'm doing the best I can. Well, and also that you are not a particle physicist. No, so it's entirely no. possible that you're going to get the obscure, interesting things about these particles, perhaps a little off, but it, you know, that is, you make that up is for it with raw well. enthusiasm. Yes, yes. I, I went down the most amazing rabbit hole preparing for this uh, particular episode and um it was quite cool because well, there is a lot going on. The funny thing, I was having a conversation with uh, Paul Sutter about the Large Hadron Collider, and he said that one of the things that's kind of funny about it was it, it sort of has turned up almost the most disappointing result possible, which is that it did its job, but no more. In other that, words, that's true yeah right <laughs> that you know it was built to discover if the higgs particle is a thing which it is it did standard model confirmed and yes. then has been desperately trying to go further to figure out whether supersymmetry is a thing try to build some find you know which flavor of the standard model is correct anything can we get a hint, please? And so far, um, it has not turned up. But <laughs> it it has turned up a lot of other really interesting particles that sort of fit nicely still within the standard model. So um, that I, th I thought it was really funny. He was he was sad that all that the Large Hadron <laughs> Collider had done was done its job and done it well and confirmed the theories, but not given those you know all those those that's unusual discoveries. So. I, it, no, no, I, I think what you just described is actually very well summed up by a, a CBC news report that is titled New Subatomic Particles Predicted by Canadians Found at CERN. Um, it's poorly punctuated. The Canadians were not the ones found at CERN. It was the subatomic particles. But moving on, uh, there is a pair of Canadian particle physics physicists, Randy Lewis found and, at CERN <laughs> and, and Richard Wallishine. And the, the two of them had uh, done a number of predictions based on if you look at quarks and you rearrange the quarks and you look at how the quarks can meet with the other quarks and how all of the forces work, you should be able to get all of these heavier, unstable particles as you force the Large Hadron Collider to higher and higher energies. And uh, 
there was indeed some of these subatomic particles discovered and the quote they have in the news in the article is lewis said he saw the paper when it was first published online at 8 p.m and he responded i saw the title and thought oh i predicted those i wonder how it turned out he recalled i looked up their numbers and said yeah that looks a lot like what i predicted great and i'm like you predicted particles they got discovered and it's gotten so blase that people are like cool it matched what i predicted we're good and they move on with life yeah so what is the particle that had been predicted and then discovered and then and then found it's this is where i have to say we shouldn't be allowed to name things it's the chi b prime and the chi b star You're going to have to you're going to have to explain some of these. Is there any uh, does it matter? Do do we know what why the names have the names that they do? I mean, it's like saying like why is the strange quark? It you know. It's it's part of how they they predicted uh you could start combining quarks and then here are the letters we're going to assign to these combinations of quarks. Uh so in this case, we have uh a bottom quark and two down quarks uh, to make one of these particles. And the other one is another combination with the bottom quark. And it's this bottom quark that's the issue because it weighs a lot. So finding particles that include the bottom quark is something that's new and exciting. And apparently Canadians don't get very excited when you ask them for quotes in the newspaper. <laughs> huh, I predicted this. Um, <laughs> okay, so so just to give people a, just a tiny little bit of background information, when you mash quarks together, like so give, they're give... not mashing quarks together. So so what the Large Hadron Collider does is is it accelerates protons, uh, in the kind of experiment that we're talking here. In other cases, it it accelerates other uh, ions, atoms. Uh, it it accelerates streams of protons to extremely high velocities, smashes them together, and all of the mass energy of the protons and all of the kinetic energy of the protons get combined together in one very small volume. Mm -hmm. And this released energy from both the mass and the kinetic energy, and it's the kinetic energy that matters the most here, is free to form new and interesting particles, including quarks that have not yet decayed into more stable formats. And, and so in this case, we have all, all of the stable things that we're used to dealing with are made of combinations of the up and down quark. This one, it went and included the bottom quark as well, making it unstable and making it harder to create harder to observe right but they did it much to the non-excitement of the <laughs> right. predictors right so so um so i get the question that i was asking though right is that like for example a proton is made of some combination of up and down quarks yep right mashed together right into a well, particle they're, they, they're, they're not mashed well, they're bonded sure bonded um <laughs> So, so though that is how you get a proton. That if you put some combination of up and down quarks in a very close area, you're going to get a proton. And yes. if you put a different combination of quarks, you're going to get a neutron. If you put a different combination yes. of quarks, you're going to get, and those are the stable ones. And then you've got all these interesting things, all this other yes. stuff. And so, I guess what you're saying is you took quarks that normally aren't seen together created particles with the Large Hadron Collider that decayed into the combinations of quarks that normally wouldn't be seen together. Exactly, exactly. And the difference between these particles is just this, the spin of the particles. Right. And, and so they're, they're made of the exact same constituent quarks. And and cool, we got new particles. We did this. This was the right. first one I found back in 2014. So we went from Higgs to, well, nothing's exciting. Right, anymore. but if you look at like like I know like on Wikipedia and stuff, you can see these big grids yeah. of all these particles, and you know it's like this one is the up up down, and this is one's the and so like they're taking these different combinations. If I you know 
and that's where the prediction comes from is is you say yes. you know there's like the periodic table of elements there should be something if you put a charm and an up and a strange together that should make a particle yeah it will probably have this cascade of particles when it gets released it will probably have this kind of 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 energy level that's going to take to build it and then when they run they're looking for those they're looking for that to happen. And so at this point, now that the basic framework has been done and you've got all these openings in the standard model, now it's a matter of filling in all those blanks, right? And and this is where the particle physicists on the theoretical side are two not exactly excited Canadians in this story. Uh, you just keep hammering they... that, don't you? <laughs> I'm sorry, this is the funniest <laughs> quote I have ever run across. Um, these are two brilliant human beings who made a brilliant prediction and had the most non-exciting yeah. quote. Um, so, so here, here they are working in their lab, working through the, the mathematics and by lab, I mean, probably an office with a computer and they, they figure out what are the binding energies? What are the energies of the particles? And when all of this decays, what do we expect that spike in the power spectrum coming out of the Large Hadron Collider to look like? So they predicted that energy that we would see uh, in the Large Hadron Collider and they got it right. And that was cool. So bottom down, down, a couple spin variations that have different masses. Nailed it. And and the frustrating part is this is just part of the normal everyday standard model, which we understand, we know how it works, but we don't know why it works. And this drives particle physicists mm -hmm. to extremes. And and by extremes, I mean it drives them to create things like supersymmetry, string theory, proliferations of particles, and we're not finding any of right, these. Right, right. And that was back to sort of what I mentioned earlier on is – still these 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 deeper extensions to the standard model i mean i guess the best thing that they're doing is able to rule out low-hanging fruit they're able yes. to say oh you know the simplest parts or the the parts of the of supersymmetry that we should be able to detect we haven't been able to detect therefore that model of supersymmetry is probably wrong but there's a hundred more that you got to work your way through. And and so far, we're just on the straight and narrow of straight and boring standard model, which I don't know why that delights me so much. I I like the fact that our universe has has potentially no deep underlying physics that explains why some of these things are true that we can understand at well, this moment. But if you went back a hundred years and said, you know, there's talk to Niels Bohr and said, hey, quarks, here's how it works. Here's the standard model. I think he'd be pretty interested. He'd oh, cool yeah. With and and with the subatomic uh, standard model, one, one of the paradigms, it's not an accurate paradigm, but it's, it's the way my brain thinks about it is with the standard model, we're kind of with particle physics where Kepler was with planetary dynamics. We know the rules. We understand the rules. And we don't know why the rules. Right. And we we needed Newton to get the why. And um, we just haven't had someone come up with that white, right why for particle right. physics yet. So a puzzle piece found. What else has come up out of the uh, Large Hadron Collider? So what's cool is it turns out that quarks can partner up in more than just threes. Uh, for the longest time, we were used to our happy up, up, down, 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 up, whatever, all the normal combinations of three. And then in 2015, we uh, found out that sometimes they come in groups of five. This is the pentaquarks. Right. And um, so suddenly we have this... Uh, I mean, it isn't too suddenly. There was data from 2011 and 12 that hinted at this, but 2015 was when the confirmation came. And suddenly there's this, this entire new realm of ways that we can combine things, more math to be done, more energies to be predicted. And it's just 
cool to see that nature still has surprises for us on how part how particles can partner up P partnering particles but if and so you know it's the same situation though right like you know a pentaquark or five quarks together dissolves pretty quickly so yes so it's not a stable thing but then does that open up this whole idea that you could you could then have different combinations of you know five times yes five to the power of five right that gives you a lot of combinations six they, the they come in they're in evens right so you have a ton of combinations for how you can have these quarks be together yes it's awesome right but they play no role in our day-to-day -day human society okay no no but they're cool well it's just got such a great name though pentaquark yes yes i like it yes um and and not to be outdone uh so so that was 2015 and 2016 decided well if you can have particles made of three quarks and you can have particles made of five quarks let's go ahead and find those made of four quarks and and so 2016 was when the tetra quark particles came to be a thing and this is where things start to become extraordinarily hard to pronounce um Pentaquark is nice and friendly. Uh, Tetraquark just makes me struggle for some reason. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It doesn't roll off the tongue as nicely. But is it? I mean, when I think about sort of the way that people are searching up the periodic table of elements, right? They are they are adding protons to atoms. They're bombarding them with protons, and they're making briefly ever more heavier elements. Yes. And th and that's one line to move down. And then I guess this other line is to say, let's make individual particles that are made of more quarks. And it's yes. kind of like, I don't know, like when I think of, you know, from a computer science standpoint, right? Like, let's have a faster processor or let's have a processor with more processors. And... Right? And that's the way computer science is going these days is let's make a computer that has more cores as opposed to just a faster, you know, a faster computer because it's, it's more productive. So at least with going up the periodic table of atoms, um, there we're just trying to, to deal with uh, how do you hold it together before it decays into multiple particles. Um, and the issue is the force across the diameter of the atomic core. Um, so if, if you don't look fast enough, uh, the, the force literally can't reach all the way across that atomic core. So the atomic core falls apart with, with the quarks. The, the entire thing is just like, we, we don't want to do this, man. Yeah. And, and it, becomes pure energy and a completely different identity. Uh, so it's it's not a nice, clean parent and daughter particle like you get with the periodic table of atoms um, with the, and some people refer to particles as the periodic table of particles, which is why I'm trying to be specific. Uh, here, they go back into pure energy and can come back out in a whole variety of different ways, just adding to the confusion. Anyways, we had 2015 pentaquarks, and I, I'm going to actually throw in a dig. The pentaquark people uh, were were amusing and pointed out that their particle they were going to call charmonium, which sounds like some sort of a Pokemon. Uh, <laughs> but I've got to catch them all. Yeah, it's kind of adorable, but the. Uh, Tetra quark people a year later gave their particles the um, names X4140, X4274, X4500, and X4700. Okay. Yeah. Is there, I, I mean, unless you've got some reason why that's supposed to make sense, please continue. <sighs> no, those are just the, the names that are related to their masses. Um, okay. they're, they're combinations of charm and strange quarks in that particular case. There's also some Z versions um, of the tetra quarks. 
so yeah they don't give these things exciting names but it's i mean we're at the point now where stars don't get exciting names now right? stars just true. get great big numbers and depending on their catalogs so i think this is a good thing that there are so many particles now that you just don't even have to name them anymore that that's that's fair um so so then 2017 came along and here uh we continued to up the energies that the large hadron collider uh collisions were occurring at up the energies of the masses that had to be had the potential of being found and they found yet another set of new particles. In this case, we went back to our standard, what we call hadrons. These are particles that have three quarks. Uh, here we have an omega C zero and a chi C that comes in a couple of different varieties. Uh, the, the omega contained two strange and a charm. The uh, chi particle contained a charm, a strange, and an up. And, and this was going back to that same model of just plugging through and figuring out what are all the possible combinations of three quarks? Can we attain their energies? And if we look, do we find them? And we're just pulling these right. out one at a time. Right. And I sort of imagine this, right? Like a, a particle physicist, a theorist sits down and goes, huh, well, you know, if I put two ups and a strange together, what will that probably look like? What will the amount of energy be that it's going to take to make that? What are the resulting cascades of particles that we should detect in the detector? And then they, they tell the people who are actually operating the LHC, they say, you know, crank the, the energy up to this exact number and then give me the data from the detectors and you should see this precise cascade of particles coming out. And if so, then Nobel Prize, please. Right. Not all of them are getting Nobel Prizes, no, I know, sadly. At this point. I, I'm pretty sure our, our two uh, Canadians with unexcited quotes aren't anticipating a Nobel <laughs> Prize. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, so yeah, sorry. we have. They are, and they're polite. Yeah. Um, so we have our up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom quirks, and they they can be added up in all these different ways, and it's all politely predicted by the standard model. And so far, that's that's have the you got model anything we're sticking that, with. that pushes, challenges, threatens no. the standard model? Nothing. No, I do have something cool out of superconductivity, though. Sure. Okay, so it turns out the Large Hadron Collider is not the only game in town when it comes to discovering new particles. Uh, this was something I'd never heard of before. I really enjoyed prepping for this show. It, it turns out there's some, there was a prediction by Atori Majorana back in 1937 that you could have fundamental particles fermions that are both their own matter and their own antimatter version so if you switch over to the antimatter universe nothing changes with this particular particle and having predicted in 1937 we have as of 2017 totally confirmed that this sucker exists it it started to have predictions on how to make the bound states and how you might be able to find them in superconductors in 2008 they started to see early signs that they were there in 2012 2017 they were ready to say here they are we have a particle that is its own matter and antimatter pair awesome and and predicted it only took what 80 years to figure it out little things it takes time sometimes but does that i mean does that prediction cause 
any problems to the standard model? No, All right. no, no. We're we're in a nice, beautifully predictable, handleable, no supersymmetry, unpronounceable words, yeah. uh, particles required. And I don't know why I'm so overjoyed at this, but <laughs> you just. I, 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 I am surprised, actually, because, you know, I, I am always telling people that physicists, that scientists are delighted when things turn up that are unusual and unexpected. And I know dark matter, I'm sorry, dark energy tickled you. So the fact that, yes. that the, the standard model is just holding up is, you know, it's got to be enraging. How can you I, even so hold it together? I, I think it's a matter of the fact that there's so many people out there making up particles in order to come up with underlying physics that we have no evidence for. I, I don't like that just at a purely emotional level because the standard model is based purely on observables and and I'd like to find a why that doesn't require adding a gazillion things to the universe that have no observable evidence yet. It's uh, purely emotional. Yeah, it's no not kidding. logical. Like the oh, the universe has any obligation to It has none. Yeah, to to be simple and and provide what you require. No, ma'am. The universe has its own rules and it's our job to discover them as they are. You know this. I, I know this, yeah, but every time someone comes up with a theory and says, and we can't prove it currently, or says, and this requires creating all of these things that we have no evidence for, part of me is like, okay, I'm going to wait mm -hmm. until there's evidence. My observational heart denies you until you have proof. And my observational heart is overjoyed that currently <laughs> the universe is like nope nope no nope. sorry theorists yeah well you know what it is it's your anti-string theory bias it's true which it's has true. actually been now i believe most people have your anti-string theory bias so i really like to feel like you were <laughs> ahead of the curve on this one you were hating string theory know. before hating string theory was cool it's true yeah. it's true <laughs> did you have anything else no just okay. the the fact that large no, we get it. We collider get it. The, is the whole, <laughs> awesome the, the standard model holds yes the large hadron collider was a disappointing success no it was a glorious <laughs> a success, glorious success. It, it, it answered all of the questions yeah it didn't ask any new ones didn't give us big new confusing that's funny did, we'll have to go back to the superconducting, super colliding one in Texas. The tunnels are yeah, still there. Yeah, they filled that. I thought they filled no, them in. They may have filled them in a bit, but the, no, for sure the tunnels are still there. Okay. Yeah. So go back to Texas. Uh, well, before we wrap up this week's show, I just want to remind the people who are listening to this as a podcast that Pamela and I actually stick around for another half hour and answer everyone's questions live in the in the chat so it's another half hour of us talking about news uh and anything anybody wants to talk about so and you don't have to be here live to be able to listen to this you can actually get the full feed of astronomy cast so i'm sure there's a link somewhere do a search for astronomy cast full feed you should be able to find that as a podcast and hear us ramble for another half hour if this isn't enough astronomy cast all right pamela thanks as always and we'll see you next week Sounds great, Fraser. See you next week. And now we save. Save. I'm glad I got that quote out of out of Paul because that set a good tone for for this this week, which was just Pamela was right. I believe is the, <laughs> is the gist to this. Four eighty six. Yeah. Okay. And look at that. You never caved on on string theory, and here you are. It's true. It's true. Next, wormholes. 
That's what I mean. You're going to say no to wormholes and white I, holes. I am. Yeah. Yeah, no. What about what about other dimensions? I'm I'm okay with right. having a few more. Okay. All right, let's take on some questions. Hugo Burnham asks, can you explain what role, if any, high energy particle physics plays in the cosmology of the early universe? Ooh, good question. Uh, how early do you want to go? Well, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, you know, the universe is made of particles. So, you know, it plays a 100% role in the universe. But I guess the question is, when you think about the, the particle you know, the state of the particle physics in the earliest universe, does it have these echoes through the size and scale and shape of the universe that we see today? Uh, it has echoes more through the composition of the universe. So, uh, and in how the earliest stars were able to form. Uh, okay, trying to break down all the things going through my head. First three minutes of our universe, uh, everything went from pure energy to inflation to uh, the entire universe essentially acted like the inside of a star that doesn't exist because uh, the densities weren't quite identical to a star. So uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, it, it produced very specific ratios of hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. And looking out across the universe, that's what we see. And because it stopped with just those trace amounts of lithium and beryllium, when the first stars formed, they didn't have metals that they could radiate in. So having these metal lines actually affects the cooling rate of stars, affects how their outer atmospheres work without those metal lines, first generation stars were able to be huge theoretically. We'll hopefully know if James Webb Space Telescope ever launches. Different story. Oh, it's gonna um, launch. It's got to launch. Yeah. I I just like I I'm I'm so worried that like there's gonna be some sort of a rogue natural disaster that just wipes it out at this point. Just the universe going, no, you can't have nice things. Um different my Story. my plan is to encase it in glass and if it if it never launches it never fails it'll always be there right there where we can look at it and admire it and it never failed anyway please continue anyways uh so due to the specific ratios of of elements that came out of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We got the first stars that behaved in certain ways that are unlike stars that we have today, yada, yada, yada. Universe evolved to have what we have today. Um, but beyond that, particle physics is what allows some elements to form in the outskirts of stars through the slow buildup of neutrons. Particle physics is what allows uh, one of my favorite tests of relativity, which is muons, which are unstable, form in the upper atmosphere and travel at close to the speed of light through the atmosphere. And the travel time in our time is greater than the half-life of the muon, but because the muons watch slows down as it comes through the atmosphere it's able to live long enough to hit the surface of the earth and be detected so particle physics lets us test relativity um particle physics is just like part of day in day out existence uh it's cool yeah see let me pull some other questions here um well i guess one other thing that's that's interesting is just this that that the early universe had these different densities that were microscopic to our concept now and yet those densities were magnified into galaxy clusters and huge structures that are billions of light years across today they were tiny little microscopic Variations microscopic is 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 the wrong way to think of it it was very very slight regions of under and over density and by slight i mean parts in the thousands ten thousands hundred thousands so it wasn't that you had 
uh, one extra atom in this one teeny tiny part of the universe. It was that this region that became a, a super cluster over here was as a region larger by like one proton per cubic meter or something. So it was a very slight overdensity in the region versus a microscopically small overdensity. Right. Um, so this question comes from uh, John Suffill. It says he, a local club sent an email said if a galaxy's light can reach Earth and intelligent radio signals can too, I would say that the signal would be too weak for us to be able to pick it up. Who's right? Um, it well, there's a difference between the signal reaching Earth and the signal reaching Earth and being detectable over the background noise. If I am in a extraordinarily loud dance party with blaring music and a bunch of different people on bachelor and bachelorette parties out screaming at each other drunkenly, me standing in the corner reciting my ABCs will never be heard to someone sitting on the other side of the room, although the sound waves coming out of my mouth will probably travel all the way across the room. They're simply not audible over the background noise. Right. It is entirely possible that the Earth is currently getting hit by isolated photons of radio light that originated in an alien civilization and we have no way of detecting it above the background noise of nearby stars the background noise of background galaxies now we do hold out hope that if we make direct focused radio observations of individual star systems that our focused observations will be able to detect focused signals. And, and that's really our best hope. I uh, imagine if some distant civilization was trying to communicate with its own version of the Voyager space probe and was sending a directed signal and we happened to be line of sight with that signal that we might be able to detect if it's not too far away, just like aliens might be able to detect our directed signals that are sent out towards our Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 space probes. Right. It's, it's a matter of what are you looking for and are you worried about detecting it over background noise? Right. And so that, that concern that aliens are listening or watching our old TV shows and watching Hitler's broadcasts back in the day and using that as a, as a opportunity or as a, you know, as a decision to load up their sp their invasion fleet and come earthward is probably not going to happen. Even super powerful alien radio arrays are not going to be able to detect our transmissions. It's when we fire a focused beam at another star system and they fire a focused beam at us. That's when you get the potential for communicating across these vast distances. Yes. And yeah, yeah, you got it. I have nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse. Phoebe McMullen is asking, what are Fermi energies? I'm doing some stuff on strange matter and I've hit a wall. Do you know what a Fermi energy is? I, uh, not specifically. I mean, my, my brain is going, is this the allowed energies of a fermion in a system? Are, are you referring to like the allowed energies of an electron as it orbits? Um, I Apparently don't... it is the concept in quantum mechanics referring to the energy difference between the highest and lowest occupied single particle states in a quantum system of non-interacting fermions at absolute zero temperature. So I think that's what you were kind of saying. Yeah. So I was, I was actually looking at a simpler case of it, um, not the absolute zero case. I, I don't know enough to do more than find a book and yeah yeah i remember doing homework problem sets on that i calculate the remember. fermi energy of this yeah yeah let's get another question uh here's a good one uh gray row sentent asks why is the speed of light the speed of light because the universe said so 
There so is, it, it's yeah. it's actually one of those fundamental things of the universe that's just baked in where every observer observes the speed of light as the exact same speed. It's it's baked into the universe as that thing that determines the the ticking of time. It it's more fundamental than any other property. And you start with the speed of light to all observers is the exact same speed and move on from there. That's that's your ground zero. Right. And 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 that's not the only one, right? There are a bunch of these fundamental um, constants in the universe. They are independent. They have no relation to each other. You can't derive one from the other. Right. The speed of light is one. The force of gravity is another. The alpha, you know, there's there's a bunch of these constants. And each one is just like if you measure the universe, you would run through this checklist and go like, oh, this is this is what the speed of light is and so on. And you could theoretically go to some other universe and find different values for all those numbers and yes. have a universe that doesn't work the way we understand it. So uh, this is another one of those missing underlying physics situations where one of the main reasons that people argue for a multiverse is there's no reason for us to have the value of gravity we have, for us to have the fine structure constant A, that one over 137 that we have. Um, I think it's one over 137. Um, so given that there's no underlying physics that says make this so, people want there to be multiple universes because without underlying physics, the next best explanation is because an outside entity that made our universe said make it so and that's uncomfortable and the idea of a multiverse doesn't require that there is no entity out there rolling the dice but at the same time it means there doesn't have to be right and you know I mean, obviously you can say well you could just roll the dice and you just get failed universe after failed universe until the dice come up with the right numbers across the board that thing can even exist right so, and this is one of the ideas of a quantum foam that has constant bubble use universes popping out where some are stable and some are unstable. And we just happen to be in one that that is perfectly set up for us to end up here. And to bring that conversation sort of around to what we were talking about with the actual with the particle physics and, and the Large Hadron Collider and and things like that. Like, this is what the extensions to the standard model are trying to do. They're trying to look at those two independent constants and say, is there any reason why the fine structure constant is this while the speed of light is that? Is there a way that they could be connected? That to find any of these what seem like independent variables and find connections for them, the way electromagnetism and say, uh, you know, the Strong, like and weak the strong and weak forces have been merged together into this one concept and yet right. gravity still won't fit that's a great that's a great example of the kinds of connections and deeper rule systems that that physicists and astronomers are looking for and and right now there is just this gigantic list of ones that don't that don't fit it's interesting you know people always say like oh if we could just get gravity into you know to stick it together with with all of the quantum mechanics, but actually that would still leave a ton of stuff on the table that we still don't understand. And, and the question that I continue to have, and this may just be me as an observational astronomer, uh, what if gravity is that geometric thing that Einstein described it of rather than a, a particle physics uh, force mediated by bosons feature. What if it is this fundamentally different baked into the universe geometry and not a force in the same mm -hmm. way? Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's the question I, I have and no one has so far been able to do more than go, Oh, Oh dear. Yes. Yeah. And maybe nobody can. I mean, this yeah. could be, you know, the problem with other universes and things like that is you can't get over there and look at them. 
So it's true. Um, there was a question here about uh, water worlds. So, oh, man, I'm gonna try and find the question, but the the question was. Kevin Costner's movie was not very good. It's so, worth watching, though. As, as a way to tell you um, if there could be uh, life on water worlds. So, okay, so one of the things that, that's come up recently is there's, there's this idea that the Trappist-1 planets could actually have a lot of water, too much water to be habitable. And so they're saying things like 50% water. And I don't know what too much water to be habitable means, no I, dirt well so here's the thing when when we start thinking about enceladus and europa as potentially habitable worlds we're talking about worlds that don't have continents they don't have land they have sub ocean heat sources and water uh so in looking at the Trappist system, I, I can imagine someone arguing that they don't have bipedal life forms walking around on a non-existent surface contemplating space flight. But whales, whales, mm -hmm. why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with the civilization of jellyfish? Octopuses. Uh, cephalopods would take over if they just lived longer. Not oh, yeah. a biologist, not yeah. a biologist. No, but oct octopuses, for example, are really They're smart. They're amazing problem solvers. Yeah. So I... Well, but I guess it's more like you wouldn't get the, the more... All you would have to work with is hydrogen and oxygen as your building blocks of life. That, the, that if it's 50% water, then the, the bottom of your ocean is thousands of kilometers deep. And the kinds of pressures involved down there would make life very difficult to form. I guess that's the gist of the idea. Well, and we don't know what sort of convective processes would be in place. We don't know what kinds of mixing and solutions would be in place. I, I'm uncomfortable with limiting what life can do when we keep finding life in places that we can't explain here on the planet Earth. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I, we get this question all the time, right? Which is like, why don't we search for different life? You know, because we don't know how. Yeah, we don't know how. And we're not done searching for regular life. Like, let's search for or water based life, like life as we know it. We've got a pretty good sense of how how we would be able to detect life as we know it. And so let's try to find that it's the low hanging fruit. Speaking of, for example, low hanging fruit, right? If I said, could you find me an apple, please? you would go look in the fridge. Yes. And then if you didn't look in the, you know, and then you might look at, at in the store and then you might go look at an apple tree. Why not find some low I, I would tell you, give me a few months because yep. there's one out right outside right. my window. If those all fail, then you might start looking for apples in weird places like the trunk of your car and under the bed and you know what I mean? And so that's all is we're just, we're so at the beginning of this idea of looking for life on other worlds, we're not done really looking for life as we do understand it. After that, if that taps out, then by all means, we'll start looking for life as we don't understand it, whatever yes. that means. So yes. Don't limit science because the real universe keeps proving itself to be far weirder mm -hmm. than anything we ever imagined. Um, okay, so Zap except Van... for particle physics, except for particle physics, right. it's so, less weird. So Zap Van Zap Van <laughs> is saying in the chat, and I think this is what the gist is that there's so much water that down deep you get weird forms of ice, right? That under the pressure and the temperature, you get some of the varieties of ice where water starts to crystallize, but it's you know it's hot temperatures, and yeah. that's above the rock and the the other kinds of elements that you'd want to get into so you so you just can't get at the carbon and the nitrogen and the phosphorus and all of those things because you've got liquid water and then below that you've got ice nine and all kinds of stuff below that so i, I that's what the challenge is and one of the interesting things uh 
that I remember there was actually a Radio Lab episode about is oh man I'm I'm blanking on the name of the experiment I think it began with the letter M it was the one where they created amino acids in uh in primordial liquids by zotting it with electricity uh the same scientists that did that experiment that i can't remember the name of uh created these containers of ices with carbo uh with organic materials in them and have watched the extraordinarily slow uh processing of of new complex carbohydrates over the decades where this has actually gone from the original experimenter to one of his graduate students who's now a full tenured senior professor and i mean senior in age even mm -hmm. somewhere else so when you have multi-generational experiments experiments showing that hydrocarbons can actually slowly under go transitions and bonding in ISIS, we're still learning. Mm -hmm. And like no life involved. Like it's just water. Oh things. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love Wa well, those... water with carbon. Right. But I love those, with... those uh, closed ecosystems that you can yes. make. You can make like a, um, you know, you can put in the right balance of water and, and various organic material and plants and stuff. And then you can seal the thing up and it will find you know, as long as there's sunlight coming in, it will find this equilibrium. And uh, yeah. uh, Cody from Cody's lab made them in glass tiles. You know, the glass, you know, those like glass blocks that you'll build like a, a wall yeah. to a shower or something like that. And he drilled them and then he put these little ecosystems, but he modified them in each one and then was going to build a wall out of all these little ecosystems. Oh, wow. I think it's such a great idea. Um, I, my fish tank requires constant care. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? But the question is like, how complicated can you make one of these closed environments? And it matters because, you know, we need to figure out how to live in space. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Quad Limit is saying that Sar Sarwa teaches that the Mon Calamari came from a water world and they were technologically advanced. They formed a relationship with species that lived deep and mined minerals for them. There you go. And Noel Ruppenthal's mentioning that we did the Miller, we did an episode of Miller Yuri. That's the name of it. I knew the letter M. I forgot everything else. Yes. Uh, so as things wind down, uh, if you like this kind of Q&A and picking my brain, join our Patreon. I do special office hours for an hour every week that I'm not traveling with our $5 and up patrons. And you can join me on Zoom. It's except for the first Friday of the month. It's right after this episode. So it would actually start 15 minutes from now uh, this week because it's the first Friday of the month. We're going to do it on Sunday, allowing people in other time zones to join in. So consider if you aren't already supporting our show through Patreon. We have lots of cool perks. Just go to patreon.com slash astronomy cast and find out how you can keep all of this content coming and keep Susie and Chad employed. And Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I want to do another quick plug, as always, to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the people who are chatting down at the bottom of the live stream. Just go to wshcrew.space and uh, sign up. They'll give you all the instructions. All right. Until next. Are you going to be here next week? We're going to do same I, bat time, same bat channel? Same bat time, same bat channel. I will actually be at the offices of the ASP out in San Francisco. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. You can, you can show us around. Not sure about that, but I will be recording from there. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Okay.